So in any case, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what this guy sounds like, but you should fucking stick around and pay attention. Dead promos! See, after that, anyone is good. Yeah, I don't, I don't need that, so. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, fuck put up the Billy Mummy picture. Hey, he's cool. Picture of Mummy. Face. Billy, is it Billy Mummy? It's Mummy, yeah. And you kind of need it for the uh, if, tape. If you want to be on tape, the, uh, you can see it on the internet later. Oh, oh really? Right, right, yeah, for the podcast. Yes. Yeah. You just, oh, I see. Oh, oh, what, is the Billy Mummy thing? You just, uh, yeah. you know, the yes. microphone. No, oh, you microphone. just Google okay. your name. <laughs> and comes well, I want to thank everybody, um, especially the poets in the Cleveland area. I never realized until I came here last year. How big poetry is in Cleveland, and um, we I, eat a lot. That's right, we eat a lot. And I'll tell you, I just enjoyed being here, and um, want to thank you guys for asking me to come, and I'll read a couple poems, and then uh, I'll sit the fuck down. I haven't asked you to come yet. Whoa! Hey, hey oh, speak for yourself. That's it. <laughs> you doing the or something? Okay. <laughs> All right. First poem is called "Rootless." Certainty. You never had it. Yours was an excursion filled with ambidextrous on the road episodes and spur of the moment decisions that led to loss of what is deemed sturdy. There were never any solids or routines, only awakening to plans of emotional proposal and ambiguity towards a spiral that you thought spun out of control when the masses took the train or the bus or drove in Chevy S10s to the mundane. Certainty. You never had it. Only you knew that those who chanted, My God, those who prayed and lived by the golden rule, were doomed to Zoloff inadequacies, erased our Narcissus looks in the mirror, and cheated on the South Beach diet. Certainty? No. As you shared no followers, pretended to no one felt that the only certainty there is, is a certainty of a parallel universe which you want to observe. Misguided to be suffered or celebrated, zealous to be amused by. Certainty? No. Only hope for the nothing and a prayer for the visceral. Thanks. Imagery. Imagery is never clean. Only a naive fool whose daily anticipation is based on attending a Boy Scout meeting sees the world as clear and chaste. A borderline stare at infinite dirt is an episode for the theater of the disdain. Malign loners who never know if tomorrow will come. Evil creepers who base morality on stolen merchandise. Trees breezing in the wind and gardens full of glorious flowers are not options to those who live on the other side of the hill. Imagery is filthy bare and sullen to longing victims of want, those who beg for stability but only achieve a livelihood through violence and death. Notion of delightful imagery refused to exist for them. This is a place John and I went to. Uh, it's called the Red Baron Pub in Worcester, Mass. Nice little dive. Um, we went there the first time, a girl started taking off her clothes, yeah, which made it even true. better. Yeah, so. That's only a suggestion out there. Yeah. If you grilled to listen to If they don't do it, Steve, you're going to have to. Not again. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this one's called A Night at the Baron. The barmaid leans over t to talk to you about the slow night she is having, making sure cleavage is seen by horny patrons who are ready to ejaculate toothpicks. Faces are familiar, names aren't. Even the woman you've been intimate with are forgotten niches on your libido belt. The old skeletons walk in, walk out, panhandle for money, come back to the bar, and buy a draft. You fall in love with Red, who's working her magic of lust to a guy who quite doesn't know how to play Keno. Your dream of courting, marriage, kids. But that only lasts a day, an hour, maybe even ten minutes. Then you realize she's a role player seizing those who have lost their way in a haze of beer and selling comfort shots. Still your hope holds out to find something real among the still sadness, a stare from drunken eyes, inviting to be let into a unique position. But these are intoxicated dreams, a final parlay of forced laughter 
stall tears, hidden agendas with your brothers and sisters and drink. Your head hits the pillow and you contemplate the next morning whether to stop the strangeness again or roll over so the sun doesn't get into your eyes. This one's called Obsessed with Street. I purposely drive through the baddest streets of Worcester on my way to some obscure meeting and witness the people walking to their death march. Some have seven teeth, some have two, some have beards that cover the craggy face, the beaten by light face, which yellows as each passing day grinds to a cold halt. Some sell their bodies, some don't. Some raise their glass to existence, some don't, but wish they could. It's easy for me to be on the outside looking in at these people while living on the cusp of the marginally accepted. I can witness the worthless, like some misguided tour, a trip to the perverted zoo as it were. My truck is my refuge, citing examples of lost humanity through the comforts of a heating system and an FM radio. Yes, I can leave the path of the hookers, the bums, and the socially maladjusted walk to and snuggle up at home with my Dolly Parton blow-up doll. Drink some stale beer, eat 3D old pizza, and call this paradise. Let's see. Sometimes incomplete. Severance pay for the living is never collected when the little lit, when the widow lays her husband in the garbage along with the rest of the dead letters that wither with time. No guardian insurance man will be sending a check, nor a hearse full of flowers driving down Main Street with lighted autos in tow. It is the lone, alone who die, shriveled inside a closet like a boat, who will never hear the horns of a sepulpatory band. No, the story of failure is often taken at face value in an obituary buried on page 37 in the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. The young will still ride their scooters the first warm day of spring and never consider the day when time will be spent forever in the dark. The old will trim the one small hedge in the yard, then lie down, wondering why they still have a five-year-old calendar hanging in their broom closet. Then more will die, some eulogized, some left to the rats. Some old, some young, some never loved, others adored. Some thought of daily, others never mentioned again. This is all stuff Bill Roberts rejected too, by the way. When I see him. He's getting a car. Let's go to Delaware. That's right. Sit him in the stomach with a tire. Yeah. Yeah. Clean sheets. Yeah. Surreal and maybe sober. He's climbing on roof of inane buildings, shouting at God to massacre the scar that walks zombie-like. Life going through emotion to emotion. Senseless with a cry of disdain for the Almighty. Recovering balance on a steep incline that holds a cross, a statue of Jesus, and an angel watching over the multitudes that stumble from store to store, from gambling goose to stoic march. Everybody overrates their internal strife. Kathy Lee, Oprah, Eminem. Their woes are just cannon fodder for the greasy tabloids. And old Henry will still yell his song on rooftops at 2 p.m. When the moon only peeks through wispy skies and residue from a bloody corpse will stain the sidewalk in front of the Main Street, Main Street General Star. Yes, I'll carefully glide by, skirt out of the way, and join the fallout line. <laughs> to the homeless guy on Belmont Street. <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't buy a Worcester Telegram newspaper for you today. I'm sure you saw me furiously hide my face as you approached my truck. You surprised and angered me with your other disregard for my privacy and my patience. But you do remember the one time I tried to remain virginal. I thought the Lord would look down on me with a smile as I bought a paper and let you keep the change, a whole 50 cents. I even acknowledged your wife, who sat on the curb next to you with the obligatory help us, we're homeless sign hung around her neck, like Coleridge's albatross, like Coleridge's albatross. I hope your plight gets better and you can find some semblance in your life, at least a place to live and kick up your feet. But in the meantime, you'll see more like me, a population filled with little care for you or your sign-bearing wife, except when we want some stopgap salvation by showing enough motor skill to reach for two bits in our pocket. Yeah. 
Yeah. What? That's good. I like that. Yeah. 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 Which end? Both. <laughs> Both ends of that. Okay, Graffiti at 507 Main. A lot of these poems, the, the original uh, title of this chapel, it's still the title, is um, Fallen Empathy, uh, Stories of Life and Death in the Commonwealth's Second Largest City. So a lot about Worcester, what I've observed there, what I see. Um, per capita, I'm sure it's one of the top places with homeless people. Um, there's just so many. I mean, you can swing a dead cat and see a homeless person, which is... Really sad. But yeah, but we're number one poverty. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we're number right, one. Yeah. You ain't got that on us. Our, our cats are homeless. <laughs> that's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> so feel free to swing. Oh, that's what I'm thinking. I got a hangover that would kill this room. Graffiti at 507 Main. Graffiti scrawled out on the elevated door, claiming this place sucks. As you look down at your shoes, trying to avoid the stare of some 16-year-old who thinks he has the world by the balls with a sideway hat and portable phone. And you wonder if the writing on the door should say, this life sucks, as you reach the seventh floor and enter the do domain of filth and grime. And you understand that when you enter your small apartment and you finally get the nerve to jot your emotions in a coffee-stained notebook that is filled with scribbling of villains, heroes, and big-breasted fools, that you will write another self-involved poem that describes the plight of your inner turmoil Mm -hmm. Another night of hatred, loathing, and watching time pass that can never be seized again. You then think to yourself, maybe you should buy some spray paint and draw a picture of a man hanging himself on the elevator. That thought brings a sad smile to your face. <laughs> Softball player who moonlighted as a hooker. She had a softball player look, baseball cap, stocky body, with tits ready to burst out of her Jason Veritek shirt. Muscular thighs that helped brace a pitcher's leg against the rubber on the mound. But misplaced she was, this budding superstar was a street walker on Main Street South. Two teeth missing and eyes that gleamed with street sense. I was just another horny male whose libido was bursting out nine ways sideward when I saw her flag me down near the new Razabah. We went through the customary, are you a cop quiz? No, are you? She said laughing, exposing the chiclets missing in her mouth. I grabbed her left boob to make sure I wasn't being set up. There, are you satisfied now, she asked. I took another long look at her. She could have been my niece playing for anywhere, junior college, or a shop putter on scholarship, hot up for a date. Not a prostitute in Worcester. No, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied about a lot of things, I told her, as I pulled over and opened the door to let her out. You're lost, she shrugged and waved down another customer. Maybe this guy will save her, show her the potential of goodness in the world. Maybe he'll turn her into a religion, or maybe he'll kill her, and reality will continue. Okay. A history lesson during a bout with insomnia. At 4 a.m., Lonesome Joe told me a tale about how George Patton and the beloved Ike Eisenhower used their military connections to keep General Omar Bradley out of politics. His eyes welled while remembering the soldier's general gazed at the illuminated clock that stood atop City Hall. General Bradley? He could have been president, he whispered between tears that streamed down Matt's skin. We would have never gone to Korea and some of my best friends would still be alive. Both he and I rested on a clammy, sticky bench, surrounded with the other disinherited homeless that called Worcester Commons home. Joe's love for Bradley never vanquished. He has kept a vigil for the general for more than 50 years. A great man. A great man, he continued to mutter, even after I got up and watched the light of day beginning to kiss the night. Such dedication deserves some sort of reward, I thought to myself. So I asked Lonesome Joe if he needed a 20 to get something to eat. No, no, son, he said, smiling sadly. He clutched his cane and wandered away, adjusting his blue sweater around slumped shoulders. Time has passed since my conversation with Lonesome Joe. I still have difficulty sleeping, 
and often I will wander to the commons, just to sit down on another clammy bench to think, observe, or just wonder the purpose of it all. I have heard new tales from other vanquished citizens about marriages that have fallen apart, loss of jobs and homes, deaths of brothers and mothers. But I never saw Joe again, and never again did I hear his love for one man during one fragment of time that probably nobody wants to remember. Again, I, I'm extremely honored to be here. Um, it's such just a great city, and uh, the literature is unbelievable, and I just want to thank you all. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Streets of Worcester. There are streets of Worcester.